that I'm going to run, et cetera, et cetera. And my final year students from the cybersecurity, last year, they did penetration testing, okay? Which we will come in a minute. I do not have time, as I said in the beginning, to cover everything. So every now and then I will give you uh, references. The slides will be available one o'clock on study space and you, can, you don't have to take notes now. And there are a variety of books that one might, it depends what you do, if you do Java, there is this, uh, look, there is this book, Java Coding Guidelines, that you can uh, go and read about it, if it's Java. Uh, the second book, it gives you a more overall view as the third book, and if you want to know about security, the, the yellow and black book. So there are books there, of, most of them are available on the, in the library anyway, and I give you some URLs that you can see. What I'm not going to talk is all these layers of security, because security is not just your code. If you work for a big company, they will have physical security. And there are books out there how to pick a lock, okay, as a penetration tester. And probably, uh, I've said to a few people, I met in a conference somebody, his job was to have a van, and with that van, one day it was a British gas van, next day it was a British telecom van. His job was paid by the company to go to that company in London headquarters to see if he can get access to the building by pretending to be a British gas or British telecom, etc. And the moment he was able to get in, then you have more avenues of finding passwords. People tend to write passwords on sticky notes or whatever, or whatever. So physical security is very important. Personal security, who works for you, etc. Operation security, communication security, i.e. how we exchange information, network security. There is a lot of layers there. And the company will have policies. For example, when you, three years or four years for some of you, when you join Kingston University, you sign a lot of papers. Nobody reads them, I know, but you did sign a lot of papers. One of the papers said that you're not allowed to download your own software, blah, 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 blah. That's a policy of Kingston University, okay? I had a student who worked for GE money. The policy was there, you cannot bring your own USBs. You can only use USBs given to you by this company. And they had software that the moment you were downloading on the USB a PowerPoint, somebody up the management knew about it. You were not allowed to take home documents, so they could control this, either by informing or by blocking. And that was a very interesting final year project a few years back. Training, education, we have to train people. We all make the same mistake. I have six, seven different passwords. If somebody finds one of my passwords, he or she, because he or she knows a lot about me, will be able to identify the other passwords very quickly. We have to train people about password policy, for example, about not clicking on Nigerian money, okay, and things like that. And to use the technology, like I said, there is technology out there that will block anything you do in terms of downloading to a USB, like I said before, a PowerPoint. We can put a block. It's very easy. You go to the registry, the cyber students know that, and you change something there, and nobody can save on a USB a PowerPoint. So the goals of security is prevention. So we like to prevent attackers from violating our policies. 
we should be able to detect is somebody attacking us. A few weeks ago, before the holidays, the study space was down. And the problem was there was a distributed DOS attack on Janet. And of course, recovery. We need to be able to function while we are under attack. And there are various ways of doing this and to recover. Because if you're Barclays Bank, you don't want to stop your system working because you're under attack. OK? You should have ways of carry on while you're fixing the problem, etc. There are various terminologies there. I do not expect you to read all this now. But again, it's very good to know the difference between what is a threat and what is attack, etc. And I'll give you an example. A city like Kingston or Hull or Sheffield can be vulnerable if the location is be below water level. What are the risks? You know, or if you are a town in Miami, you are under the hurricane area threat. These are vulnerabilities because of where you are. Yeah? The threat is that we face, because we are vulnerable, is if a hurricane comes, if the dam is damaged and all this water comes down, if there is a terrorist attack, whatever. OK? And implementing controls is to, for the city to say, look, I'm in Miami. I have hurric hurricanes coming every so often, whatever. What am I going to do? And to avoid floods, you might build dams. And you will always have your emergency response plans, etc. Can you see the difference? So you're thinking, it's Friday night at Kingston. I'm going to the bar, to the club. What are, am I vulnerable? Well, I will feel vulnerable. But you're younger than me, so maybe not. What are the threats? Somebody punching me. What is something I can do? Take two bodyguards, OK, to make a joke out of it, OK? So you have to think about, is my system vulnerable? What are kind of threats are there? What can I do to protect? And those threats can come from various places. Can be mostly it's human error, OK? And by employees, either deliberately or by mistake. Compromises to intellectual property. I mean, piracy and copyright infringements. I'm not saying you all do it, but a lot of people do it, yeah? By trying to download the latest film before even it comes to the movies, cinema, OK? <laughs> Deliberate software attacks. You introduce out there virus, worms, denial of service. Forces of nature, fire, flood. If suddenly we have a hurricane here, what's going to happen on the first floor of this building? I don't know. The windows might smash, the water might come in. Lecturers first, then women, and then children. OK? So a lot of threats to our information. And like I said, if we think about software, malicious code, password cracking, brute force, Denial of service, man in the middle. Man in the middle means you're communicating with your girlfriend or boyfriend. And I'm in the middle, and I can listen to you. I can interrupt your communication. It's very easy. This morning, I was breaking, or tried to break, wireless passwords around here. It's 20 pounds to buy an antenna, and then you all have the software to do it. It's not difficult. OK? Social engineering. How many times I have received an email? You are a very good customer of Lloyd's Bank. I never had a Lloyd's Bank account in my life. Or they phone me, and they say, you know, your computer, we realize your computer is, uh, has a problem. I say, how do you know? And then they put the phone down. Yeah? But there are people who do believe this. There will always be. 
my generation and mainly your generation have been brought up with computers. You know about these things. But how many 70, 80 year old people might fall into the trap, my computer? They phone me from so and so and my computer. And they take over the computer. And then if they take over remotely the computer, they can find your password. You can find your visa card and your blah, blah, blah. OK? So there, is a, there are a lot of things. So what we try to do is to protect our confidentiality, always to have integrity, and always to be the system to be available. And I always find it useful to define what is authentication. And authentication is really when you say who you are. Okay, so I come to you, I came to you, and I said, hi, my name is Dimitris Tsapsinos. You all believe me, didn't you? Right? Okay, good. Study space has this one factor authentication. You put your username, and you put your password, and you get in. If you go to the ATM, you have your card and your PIN. Yeah? So this is what authentication is. You're saying, let me in. Give me your credentials, they tell you. You provide your username and your password. It checks if your password is correct. If it's successful, you're in. Is it me? Maybe it's me. After authentication, is this? After authentication comes authorization. The point is, the point is that I said I'm Dimitris Tsatsinos, so I walked here. Maybe I'm not supposed to be here. Maybe I'm, I'm not supposed to have access to you. Maybe I am, I, I am Dimitris Tsatsinos, but hey, who knows, right? So authorization is, yes, you are in, but what are you allowed to do, OK? And there you use access control. Access control controls you in the labs that you are not allowed to download and install your software, right? So I mean. I might have access to my documents. These are just examples. I might have access to Microsoft Word, to an FTP server, but I do not have access to Sheets program or to administrator documents, right? And if somebody else goes in, he or she might have different uh, access authorizations. They, they might have access to Sheets, but they not have access to FTP, for example. The secretaries do not need FTP. Yeah? Can I shut it down and open it again? Because yeah. it's irritating. Let me see. If it's me, it's not me, is it? put it there, and I talk. Can you hear me? Can you still hear me? Yeah? yeah? OK, let's try this. So the difference is authorization, you say who you are, uh, sorry, authenticity, authenticity th you declare who you are. Authorization is what you have, what you're allowed to do. Is that a question or a hello? Oh, it's not on.
Hur ser det ut? Jag har fått ett kunde till bli en ärlig bad för mig. Så det var Okay, we are back. Right, so does it make sense? You might not need this for your project, I don't know. But you might have a project, I don't know everybody's project, that you give access to people. And what, as you will see in a minute, what you do give access, for example, if you are doing a database, you do give access to people to do X, Y, Z, but not A, B, C. Yeah. If you look around, you will find a lot of things about application security. And one of the most important one is the input validation that we saw earlier on. And there are various others that I'm not planning to cover completely. Let's go back to practicalities. As a programmer, you, are, you wish to produce software that demonstrates system, system correctness. In this example I have there, it's a very simple program. You read two inputs and you divide. You divide the first number with the second number. And then you have various tests, right? And you get six divided by two, three. It's not the only test, but you do various tests and you say, hey, it works. So I prove it's correct. Prove is a very strong word. But empirically speaking, the program does what it's supposed to do. But also, you must consider that demonstrates security. What happens if my B was a 0? 6 divided by 0. What is going to happen? It depends on your platform, I suppose on your programming platform. But how many times, ages ago, when I used, can you put those laptops down, please, again? Thank you. I'd like to see your faces as well. How many times people will say, why didn't I get 100%? Because you wrote a program that it does what I ask you to do. But you didn't go outside the box to say, what if the user is stupid enough to do that? Yeah? So better, in this simple example, is to have an else there, an if else there, that you say if B is not a zero, then go and calculate. Otherwise, give me a message that you cannot divide by zero, OK? Is that a security hole? It might be. Who knows? OK? If you do Java, you might write passwords using the string object. Makes sense. The only problem with the string object is that it will stay in memory until your automatic garbage collector comes and takes it away. The more it's in the memory, the more chances you are taking of somebody extracting it and get, get your password. So the advice from Oracle in this URL is 
to minimize such risks, use the character array. Okay? And the moment you used it, zero them. Do not rely on the garbage collector to zero out or to get rid of your string objects. Okay? Is anyone doing Java? A pure Java project here? Yeah? Think about this and go to this URL. You will see more ideas. Yeah? Use defensive programming. Never say this is not going to happen. Use in Java the assert statement. Okay? So you use the default assert false. Make sure that you give a value if it reaches this state. If it reaches this state, again, you say assert false and you have a comment that really we should never be there. Why the heck is this happening? I have to go back to my design board. Okay? But defensive programming means, one of the things that means is use the assert statement. Do not leave it without a default in this case. Yeah? Yes. Because here you say it can only be diamonds, heart, or spades, or whatever. Who knows? We never know. So make sure we always have a default. Data security policies for database, people who do databases, either front end uh, they have a web or just it's a standalone databases. For example, you might have users like Dimitris and Dimitris can use the AMP table, employee table. Dimitris can select from that table, can insert in that table but cannot delete from that table. This is again access, isn't it? What will you use? You will use the profile. So if you have people like Dimitris, James, Mark, Karen, whatever, you provide profile statements of what they're allowed to do and not just leave it open that Dimitris can go and delete an employee number, okay? Password management policies. How do we lock our account? Is there considerations? Are you going to let your user of the database or whatever to have a password forever, the same password? Or are you going to force them to reissue, to initialize a new password? Are you going to keep a history of the passwords? I don't know if you have come across a system that you go and put a new password because they force you and you put one that you used two years ago and say, no, 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 you cannot do that. And what is the complexity of your password? So with SQL, you can create profiles, like I said before, and you can say everybody who belongs into the prof table, they can only fail for logins, yeah? So if Dimitris tries four times and doesn't get in, and then have a cool time period of 30 minutes, right? So this is the way you use the profile statement to control certain things. Here, again, it's the same, and here you say the lifetime is 90 days or whatever, so every three months you should change your password. At Kingston University, we every six months we had to change our passwords as staff. I don't know what happened to students. Now they have taken it away, and I have the same password for three years, which is wrong. Believe me, it's wrong. But they made our life easier, but at the same time we have been exposed. Okay? Here is another example that you can reuse the password three times, etc., etc. It's all examples. If you do a SQL, uh, or if your project uses databases, you should be able. If you are building a, a web page and people register, 
your backend database should have this kind of profiles because an administrator can do more than a user. Yeah? Password complexity, you can put there with Oracle or whatever, a minimum length, it's not the same as the username. All this, it's not a simple or obvious word. Uh, the password differs from a previous password by three characters. You can make all these rules. It depends on the policy. And it's your project, you make the policy. Okay? Here is uh, an, uh, an, an example. We have a table called patients, and we have three names. These three poor people are not feeling well. One has pneumonia, one has broken arm, and the other has a cold and they are seen by three doctors, Patel, Smith, and Bell, okay? But there are other tables. We have a nurse's table, a doctor's table, a management table. Now, the policy is that a nurse can read the name of somebody who is not feeling well, the diagnosis, and the doctor. But they do not have the power to update the notes, okay? These are the rules of the hospital. The doctors can read the name, then I can update diagnosis, doctor, and note. The management can only read the name and the national insurance number and the doctor. Okay? So, it's the same here with seats that we use. Really? Really, you had to go all that way? <laughs> when I look at your records, I can see various stuff like your GCSEs, your A-levels. I cannot find, I cannot see though, for example, your home address, or your mom's name, or your dad's name. The secretaries can see. It's all access, right? So how do I do this? Oops using, for example, the, not only the profiles, you can use the grant statement. Grant select on this particular nurse. Phyllis is, giving, uh, uh, is allowed to select the name, the diagnosis, and the doctor on patients. Yeah? Et cetera, et cetera. So look at the profile, look at the update of how you can use it to control who has access on your problems. 95% of web apps have vulnerabilities. And again, people following me in my courses have heard cross-site scripting, SQL injection, etc., etc. Let's have an example. You can do it at home. You open Notepad and you put this code. Yeah? Okay? And you save it as test2.jsp. It's a JavaScript, right? Of course, you have to put it at the correct uh, place. So if I run it like that, okay, what I do is to say, that I provide an argument Dimitris. So I will see, welcome Dimitris. Yeah? Do we all follow this? Yeah? It's very annoying. Either you stay or you go, please. Okay? So a very simple program, JavaScript program. Yeah? That you run, giving an argument, and you see, welcome Dimitris. Nothing. There's nothing stopping you putting a script there. Yeah? And of course, my script is simply to see, oops, a new window will say attack. I can put whatever I want there. You do it at home. You have web browsers, you have JavaScript somewhere, and run it. It's very easy. So here, I can put attack as a script, and of course it's not an attack, it's just a new window that says you're attacked, okay? Usually, 
this is another example, hello underscore get.html. You have this code and you have the method get to get your information, right? From the user. So if I run the get.html, uh, asks me for first name, last name, and then I submit. So I put Dimitris Tsarchinos and then I submit it. Yeah? No problem. Can I do that there? Of course I can. Yeah? So there is a problem. What is an easy solution? Don't have get, have post. OK? So that's another tip to avoid this kind of situations. If you look at the OWASP top 10 security threats, again, number one, always, always, always is unvalidated input. Again, I have given you a URL to read about this kind of stuff, if, you, if, if this is what you do. So what is unvalidated input? It's like I demonstrated, anyone can tamper with what information they provide you. So it's very easy to give you a script that runs and takes over, okay? And they can change. <coughs> and it has different names for browsing, SQL injection, whatever. This is terminology. Always do input data validation. And one way of doing this is to using grep expressions, et cetera, et cetera. Read the references. A good tip is all your validation should be done on the server side not on your client side, right? So if it's on the client, the attacker might bypass it. So always make sure your input validation is up in your servers. And when I, I mean rigorous, it's what it says here, a strict format. It's like when you were building your first databases and you had a field gender. Well, gender can be a male, female, transsexual, I don't know, whatever. You cannot put banana, OK? Or orange, yeah? And hopefully, when you were building Access or Oracle databases, you had a drop-down menu or something to restrict the choices, yeah? For age, I assume you were building things that they were saying, really, somebody cannot be older than 150. OK? Or 110, 120, I don't know. But you were controlling the validity of the input. That, of course, it doesn't solve the problem that I am 55 and I put I'm 25, OK? On Facebook, I can put my date of birth 30 years later. Nobody's going to check. It's valid, yeah? We're not talking about this. We're talking about things that I should not really provide you. So. If, you, if your web form expects a particular form and structure, you should make sure when you validate at the server side that this is followed. So you can validate data types. If you are expecting a string, are you getting a string? Allowed character set, minimum, maximum length, etc. All these you can uh, validate against. There is this tool, if you are using, if you are building this kind of project, to automate this, rather than you go and spend another year reading about this. And it's called Zap. And if you run Zap, you see this. It only takes five minutes to download and install on your Windows. Pro, uh, Windows. And then I did something naughty. Last week, I ran it against Kingston.ac.uk. Now, somebody knows I have done it, OK? Because in the past, I have been told off. But rather than go and find BBC, I thought, Kingston, at least I'm academic here. I can use them. And when you run it, it comes back with various alerts. And here you say application error disclosure, X frame option, cookie set, whatever. And if you are divulged, uh, go down, for example, the web browser XSS protection not enabled, you see 
the problems where they are. And it's, if you know what the problems, then pr it's easier to go and solve these problems, right? So that tool is very useful to identify the problems for you, rather than you write your own code, OK? <coughs> I've told you about SQL injection. Let's say you have a login form like this, OK? Username and password. And this is the code, OK? And it's post. Once I submit this, I mean, it runs really an SQL query, doesn't it? So the SQL query is select ID from users where your name is whatever the guy gives me. And PW equals 75 you pass. I put this in red because you should always transmit using some kind of MD5 or SH1 or SH256, some kind of uh, encryption, let's call it. Okay? Make sure that you use this kind of things when you're transmitting passwords. Okay? So if I put Dimitris and I put my password as I of Athens, which is the best football team in the world, and if you don't agree this, you have failed, okay? I mean, right, if they are correct. What happens if I put, rather than <coughs> Dimitris, I put quotes, or one equals one, semicolon, etc. The system will accept it. And what happens here? It's logic. If you remember your first years, the logical AND tables and the logical OR tables, it comes to this. Well, 1 equals 1 is always true. Yes? What will you get? Everybody's. You'll get everybody's username and password. OK? The problem is, you have to be very careful with the quotes. That's why you have to validate. Going back to the previous slide, one of the validations it has to do with the quotes. Quotes is the most abusive character in order to get access. What if you put having one equals one? You might come back, the system, with all this information. Well, we haven't managed to get in, but we have managed to find that the guy is using SQL Server, okay? And we have identified the column names and the table name. So again, information that I can use to, to go further in order to attack you, okay? An attack doesn't happen like this. It starts slowly building information and more information trying to get into you. If I know you're using SQL Server, I can go and open a website to see what are the threats to SQL servers. And I will start trying those vulnerabilities, OK? So I'm, I'm not going to talk about this. You know about this, OK? So assume you have put your web server as a project or whatever, and you have a blog, a personal website, you have photos, you have music, you have whatever you want there. What we use is HTML, OK, whatever format. It's text, OK? How can you check? And maybe you should do in order to show to your marker that you have thought about this. For example, if you go to Linux, Unix, Linux, whatever, and I can run things like that, I can find information about what you're running. This is another way to see that Kingston AC UK, the server they run is an Apache. Okay? You don't know about this. Two, three people here know about this. The majority of you might have never seen it. Don't worry. Use something that's called Nikto. It's a Perl script. Somebody has written it. Have a virtual machine, run Nikto. And look what you have found here about Kingston. OK? Again, Apache, the start time, the target port, the IP, and of course, you can find more and more information. OK? If I know this information, I can attack you. That's the point. 
And if you run this Nikto on Kingston ACDK, you will find this warning that it may allow an exploit. Okay? And I haven't put a lot of information there. But it says it may allow. And then you look at this OSVDB. This is a very important number. That tells you the vulnerability. And to find the vulnerability, you go to websites like this, and you find out what that means. So <coughs> I found that this particular server had problems, vulnerability 724 and 3233. I looked at the OSVDB numbers, yeah, there. And I go to this web page, which tells me what these vulnerabilities are. So I know now the vulnerabilities. I go to another website, even if I'm 16 years old, and I find how to exploit this vulnerability. And this is the 724, and this is the 3233. So if you build something, why don't you run Nikto against your website to see what comes up? And of course, you can say to your marker, I didn't have time to fix all 10 problems. I fixed two, three, I don't know. And don't, it depends on the marker. But what I'm saying is at least you have shown some appreciation that you have done some work on securing your website. There is another program called Flow Finder if you run C, C++. It's very simple. You download it from the web. Uh, reports possible security weaknesses of your code. <coughs> and not only that, but it will tell you what, it will give you a number, which is compatible with the common weakness enumeration, and then you can go and find what exactly that means, as we did before. And you can download it from there, if you are doing C, C++. I'm sure there are for Java. Okay, so if you run this, and this is, I didn't run it, this is out of a book, okay, it will tell you that this does not check for buffer overflow. And this is the problem, okay? And then you can go to the website and find what CWE120 is, and then you can investigate how to solve it. So buffer overflow means that we risk to get a number bigger than what our processor can store. Passwords on databases. Sometimes I'm second marker because my, most of my first projects are with the cyber students, so it's no database a lot there, but I love that the people store on SQL, on Access or Oracle, passwords like that in text. Well, you won't get a good mark out of me if I see that. Right? What's wrong with this? Because everyone who picks there can easily find it, find your passwords, right? They immediately know your login. Yeah? We never store in text. How about if we encrypt? Okay? Yeah, we can encrypt the password, and that's fine. MD5, SH1, SA256, whatever, we can encrypt it. We still have problems. If you notice, Charles and Ian have the same password, yeah? Tombola. Here, we don't know that it's Tombola, but we know they have the same password, yes? Because the encryption will be the same, okay? And also, we can see that the passwords have different lengths. That's a different length to this, yeah? So now, I know that Ian has less characters than Dimitris. Or even better, to hash, okay? And if you hash, and if you don't know what all this encryption hash means, five seconds on Wikipedia will tell you, okay? If I hash, I get all this, which is, believe me, the same length. So I have eliminated the problem of the same length. What I haven't eliminated yet is that I can still see Charles and Ian 
have the same password. What even, even better has and so. It's um, you come to my house, I make you spaghetti bolognese. You put a lot of salt, you don't put any salt, you put some salt, that's what it means. Right? You use something there to salt. And there, as you can see, Charles and Ian, they have different one. So at the moment, they are all different, same length, I'm winning. This uh, has been hashed with uh, SH8256, okay? Still, and I will be more than happy if you do it for your final year project. But still, I can break it if I have enough power, okay? So, or even, even, even better. How about if you hash and solve and you repeat it 10,000 times, okay? It makes it more difficult. <coughs> so overall, how you store your password, you should make sure that nobody should be uh, able to recover from the database. You should not go back to your database and see that Tombola is the password in text. Never. You should avoid to have identical or even similar, but identical password. And the database should not give a hint of the size of the password length, right? Remember, somebody had more characters than the other. You should not, we should not know this. That's why we were trying to have the same hash length, okay? There are more uh, references there for all kinds of stuff. And for this, this idea came by visiting Sophos, where I had a student some years ago doing a project there. And it's a very nice example to see. And if I leave you with a message, never trust your input, even if it's from your nanny. OK? And thank you for listening. And goodbye. I suppose.